Okay, so today is November 9th, 2020, and this is ECE641 model-based imaging, and today we're going to pick up, I think this will hopefully be our last lecture. Not that we don't enjoy the EM algorithm. Uh, you know, we've enjoyed uh, every minute of it, I'm sure, but I think uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up today for the EM algorithm and then move on to uh, the next topic, which is hidden Markov models, I believe. Um, and, uh, right, so the expectation, uh, yes, yeah, the expectation maximization algorithm, so we're supposed to be in section 2.4. Okay, so, um, okay, it never hurts to review from my point of view. I don't know how you feel about it, but I always feel like it's a good thing uh, to review. Oh, God, it's like a chalk debacle. Okay, uh, so review. Uh, uh, so the idea is we have a Q function. Let's not even worry about the H function, because the H function doesn't really come up, right? The reason you have the H function is just to do the proof. But once you do the proof, you don't need it anymore, OK? So you have the problem is you have Y and you have X. This is, this is um, observed data. And this is unobserved data. Okay, and together these are the complete data. There's nothing better than a clean chalkboard. Um, all right. Now, so then the ML estimate. Um, that would be the ML estimate, right? Normally I write it as negative and then minimum, but here we'll do it as a maximum because by convention for the EM algorithm, I think they usually use maximums because the way the Q function is going to be defined, okay? Problem is you can't do this. can't do this. So why can't you do this? Because you don't know x. You don't know x, right? So you can't do it. Correct? So what are you going to do? Well, what you do is you say, okay, I'd like, I have the log of P of Y X given theta, right? But I don't know X. So what I'm going to do is I'll compute the expectation over X given my assumed value for the parameter. Now the problem is that the, the distribution of X depends on the thing you're trying to estimate, theta. So it's a chicken and egg problem. You know about the chicken and egg problem, right? That which came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. So, so uh, I need to know theta in order to do this. So I'll assume that well, I know some kind of theta. I'll call that theta prime. That's a guess at my theta. And then I'll take the expectation over x given that theta. Right? That, okay? And then this thing is what I'm calling Q of theta, theta prime. I put a semicolon here because the reason I put a semicolon there is because you're really mostly concerned about this Q as a function of theta. Theta prime is sort of fixed. You calculate because you're going to repeatedly replace it, right? So that's the Q function, right? Now, then what happens is that the EM algorithm becomes a 
becomes repeat theta you initialize it right and theta goes to theta prime goes to arg max over theta of q of theta theta prime right okay now what really happens though is that q is some kind of function and that function is parameterized by some parameters right so you need to calculate what those parameters are you, you have some theta prime, you need to calculate what the parameters of that function are. That step is called the E step. It's kind of invisible here. Then once you have the E set, then you have the functional dependency on theta, and then you do the M step with the maximization. Now, it might be that the maximization you do numerically, or you might do it in closed form analytically. Usually closed form analytically, but not always, okay? So now there's a Gaussian mixture model. Gaussian mixture model is is uh, uh, the uh, so I guess the way you would do it is like y is equal to the sum from m equals zero to m minus one of y so this is y n okay and this would be y n m okay and this is times delta of x n equals m so it's like a switch i didn't write it down like this previously but i think you got the idea that y n is distributed y n oops m is distributed as n mu m r m where r is the covariance. So these are Gaussian random variables, and you just select among the ones based on the label. This thing's called a Gaussian mixture. And typically, in 1D, the distribution kind of looks like this. And then you might have something like that. This would be like three components to the mixture. And it could also be in multiple dimensions. And you've done the lab, so you have some intuition for this. The question is, and then the parameters here, theta, is equal to, um, theta, oh, it's equal to pi zero. Um, oh, I forgot to write here, uh, p of, xn equals m is equal to pi m. I, I, that's sloppy, I'm sorry, but I wrote it there, okay? Then this is pi 0, u 0, r 0, pi m minus 1, mu m minus 1, r m minus 1. Oh, like this. What happened to this eraser? Like that, right? So that's theta. So now what we need to do is calculate this expression, all right? We actually did calculate the expression and um, it looks like this. What does the Q function look like? So this is what the Q function looks like, right? Um, so it's the sum over all the classes, right? And this is over time. But let's consider it only for a single time first. N is the index of time, and M is the index of class, okay? 
And uh, so this looks like the log likelihood you would have for a random variable that's Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared, okay? And, but now what you've done is you sum these for each of the possible hypotheses of which class it could have been. And you multiply it by the conditional expectation that it's from that class given the observations. So this is the posterior distribution. Everybody remembers the difference between prior and posterior? This is the posterior distribution because this is asking what's the probability that you're in class X given that you had these observations. The prior distribution is just the probability of class X given that you haven't observed anything. Right. Okay. So now the question is what happens when you maximize that? Now, oh, by the way, remember this thing here depends on your assumed parameters. So here's the chicken and egg problem. You're assuming some parameter that allows you to compute the posterior distribution of x. And then given that, you now this have this functional form and you maximize it with respect to the mu's and the and the sigmas and the pi's. So there's two pairs of mu's and sigmas and pi's. There's two pairs of them, okay? The first pair with the primes, those are the ones that you assumed that you had. And the second pairs are the ones you're going to go to, okay? This is the old one, and then you're going to get a new one with the update, right? Does that make sense? It's important to like stare at these things, I think, at least for me, and really kind of go over in your head and make sure that it's clear because it's easy to go along and you go, oh yeah, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. Before you know it, you're totally lost. It's like you're walking around in the woods, you go, yeah, I turned left at that tree and the right at that, and you know, before you know it, you're lost, okay? It's like driving around in Boston. How many people have ever driven around in Boston? You know, it was like before they invented GPS's, you had to allocate an additional two hours for any place you were going to drive around in circles. So, so you got to keep clear where you're going. Okay. So now this is the posterior probability of class M given that you've observed Y's. It turns out that the it, it, we had here the prob probability of a class the x at time n is a class m given the, all the data, but really you don't need all the data because all the data doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you anything basically. The only value of y that tells you anything is the corresponding value at that time. The other ones don't tell you anything, right? Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying here? So, and it's a subtle issue, but it, and it's important. So the conditional distribution of x n of x n equals m, given y equals y is equal to the conditional distribution of xn equals m given yn equals yn. The other values of y don't tell you anything because they're independent. The diagram looked like this. X1, uh, x1 y1 x2 y2 xn yn yeah so this is a casual construction of an image excuse me this is a casual construction of an image Casual, you mean like the x's, it doesn't make any sense because these are different pixels. You're assuming they're independent? That's what you're saying. Well, uh, that's a good point, but it's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, 
That's correct. Usually we wouldn't use this for an image for exactly that reason, because it doesn't make any sense. The pixels are dependent, right? So, uh, so this would be for some other form of data. That's why I gave you things like examples where you had plants that were fertilized and unfertilized. You know, maybe the fertilizer from one plant would leak over to its next door neighbor. So that would be a violation of this model. But we usually use it for unordered quantities. So it doesn't matter where the plants are physically, where they're next or neighbors to each other, okay? Or if you have independent observations. These are Gaussian mixture in this case. Each random variable, this is an important point, and it's easy to, to miss, okay? Uh, it's especially easy to miss because you can look at it and you can say, oh yeah, I understand that, and then you didn't understand it, okay? So these Ys, these Ys are independent. For, so you have a sequence of Ys, but they're all independent. Because these Ys are independent and the Xs are independent also. So it, you're, you have them ordered, you, numbered from one to n, but the ordering is arbitrary. It doesn't really matter because they're all independent anyway. It's just that you're indexing them, okay? In the next chapter, we'll talk about hidden Markov models where you have a dependency. And in the most, where this ultimately goes is the X's here could ha be a 2D random field. So you'd have a spatial dependency, right? So, but right now we're assuming they're independent. When they become independent, it gets more complicated. Right, so are you clear? Does that make sense? Um, and you're clear about this here? So because they're independent, you only need the Y at that one time. When we go to hidden Markov models, that's not going to be true. You're going to need all the Ys in order to compute the conditional distribution of any label. So in other words, if you had like a sentence and you were using hidden Markov models, you were using these methods to classify phonemes or words in a sentence. Like this kind of model can be used, for example, in word completion, okay? Then, then uh, you'd want to see the whole sentence in order to try to figure out what, what the conditional uh, distribution of the, it could be like a spoken sentence, right? Then you'd want to see the whole sentence in order to figure out what the conditional distribution of one uh, word was, okay? Or one phoneme. Okay, so that's important. Um, Okay, so given that, then this function only has to depend upon the y at that one time. And so this is just a function, and this isn't, the function here isn't a function of time. It's the same function at every time. You just plug the y in, you plug in the theta prime you're gonna use, and you, and you plug in the m's, okay? And, um, and then you do this calculation. Because the, uh, so where does that calculation come from? Uh, that calculation comes from here. That you know that the posterior probability of P of X equals M given uh, YN and theta uh, prime, that's going to be equal to the probability of YN X n equals m um, uh, divided by, uh, yeah, oh, n theta prime, divided by uh, the probability of y n uh, given theta prime, right? That's his Bayes rule. But this term here, can, computed by, can be computed by computing the probability of y n and x n equals, say, k and theta prime times the sum from k equals 0 to m minus 1. So that's what that expression up there is. This is just the expanded version this is the expanded version of, um, well, the top on the top is this, okay? 
And on the bottom is the same thing, only I sum over this variable. The other way to look at it is that this, it's basically, this conditional distribution is proportional to the numerator, but the numerator, if you, as a function of m, is not going to sum to 1. It's going to just sum to something. In order to make it a probability distribution, you've got to normalize by the sum of this thing over 1. See, I just replace this m with j, and I sum over it. So that now, this is a valid probability distribution, okay? Is that uh, clear? Is there any questions about that? Or does that just look like a lot of symbols up there that just is jumbled up like a, a psychedelic poster? Yeah. So it's the probability of m over the probability of everything. Yes, it's the probability that x equals m divided by the probability that x equals anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah? That's a good way of putting it. I like that. That's exactly what it is. Actually, the, all right. Does anybody, it's really good to think about, you know what? As a society, we don't think enough anymore, okay? We just do. I mean, doing is good, but you have to think. It's like that tactics and strategy thing, okay? Like, tactic, strategy, tactics without strategy. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't matter how fast you run if you run in the wrong direction, okay? What difference does it make? Just run it, just pick a random direction and run. You're not going to get anywhere, okay? So you got to think about where you might be going. So let's think about it one more time. Is everybody clear on this? Does that make sense? Sometimes what happens is you blink your eyes. It makes perfect sense, and then you blink your eyes and you can't remember what it meant, okay? So everybody blink their eyes, look at it again, and see if it still makes sense. Does it still make sense? Any, anybody want to? comment or muse about its meaning? Okay. So, it's sort of funny. I'm like, I'm like the exactly the opposite of most people. Like when you, when I, when I go to presentations, people will like do pr like presentations and they'll put up like all these words and I'm like, could you put up some equations so I can understand this better? So, like, most people hate the equations. And they're like, could you explain in words what you mean? I'm like, could you explain in equations what you mean? Because equations are a very efficient, compact way of expressing abstract ideas precisely. And, uh, okay, so now once you have the f function, okay? So, and, and what do you actually do? What you really do when you go to do this on a computer is usually the number of classes is limited, okay? So you have a 2D array. We're going to talk about this in just a minute. Okay, I'll say it in words. Then what I'll do is I'll say it again and I'll draw a picture. So you see it both ways. What happens is that you have a 2D array. So you have time and you have class, okay? So let's say you have 10 classes and 100 time samples, okay? So you have a 10 by a 100 array, right? So what will happen is that this function will take on a value for every class and every time. Because theta prime is fixed. You're doing one iteration of the EM algorithm, so theta prime is fixed, right? So you fill this 2D array in, and for every time, you do the calculation of this function as a function of class. So it fills in the 2D array in memory, right? It's 10 bytes 100. Once you have that 2D array calculated, now you use it to do these calculations. So for every class, you sum the 2D array over time. When you do that, it's going to tell you the expected number of samples that fell into that bin. That's the thing that is like the two points or the 1.7 children per family, okay? So that's going to give you n. Now if you sum n over m, what's it going to sum to? So that thing is n. That tells you the expected number of samples that fall into every class, right? 
And then um, and then if you sum that over M, what's it going to sum over? The number of samples in time. We call it time, but it's really just an ordering. It's a re you could use any ordering, the outcome would be the same, OK? Because they're independent. Later, the ordering will matter, but right now it doesn't. So if I sum this over m, I'm going to get n. So if I divide it by n, I'm going to get a, this thing will always be n. n always is positive, right? So this will be a positive value that sums to 1. Because it's normalized by something which is equal to that sum, right? Is there any questions about that? Now, you can also, if I sum this, this is the same as this, only here I'm, I'm summing, I'm using these as weights to sum the actual y's. So if I divide by nm, I get a weighted average. And the weight's proportional to the probability that y came from class m. If the probability that it came from class n is almost zero, then it'll have no contribution to the mean. So this will be the, the mean for each class. Then here, once I have that, I plug this into here. And this is like the variance, the standard deviation. The extension of this to the multivariate case is kind of clear. But this is a scalar case. So this is, the, this is going to be then the expected variance right, for each class. Uh, what this is saying, by the way, is k here is saying that uh, k plus 1, because this is an iteration. I'm using math notation here for iteration as opposed to pseudocode notation. If I put it into pseudocode notation, it's going to be uh, maybe clearer. Okay, so this is, this is the picture of the algorithm, OK? We talked about that a little bit last time. But let me look at this. So in a pseudocode notation, this is maybe a little clearer. And what I'm going to do, I can erase this, right? So I want to draw this array, because the array is the critical idea in terms of implementation. So you have. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is n equals, and this is m, oh, this is n equals, and this is m equals 0, 1, 2, OK? So first, you fill this table in. You compute these values, p and m. That's what I was talking about. So p and m is the probability that the sample at time n has class m. Yeah, it, when you, so in here, you put like, you know, p uh, 4, 1, OK? Now, if I sum this way, um, if I sum, it's equal to what? Excuse, excuse me? OK, so this is the probability that sample 4 falls into class 1. If I sum this column of this array, what's it equal to? It's equal to 1. Because that's the fourth sample has to fall somewhere. So the sum of the probabilities that it falls into 0, 1, and 2 buckets has to sum the 1, because it had to fall somewhere. OK? If I sum this way, if I sum that way, what's it going to tell me? X right, so it's the probability, it's, it's not probability, it's actually the expected number 
of samples that fall into category two. So this would be equal to what I'm calling N2, actually N hat two. Right, does that make sense? Because each one of these is the probability that, this is the probability that the third sample found on the category two. And this is the probability that the fourth sample found the, so the expected number of samples that fall into category two is the sum of these values across this way. That's not gonna sum to one. It's gonna sum to like 1.7 children per family kind of thing, right? Okay. Um, now, uh, filling in this table, uh, you have to normalize, but that's not so bad. So, filling, what's the computation required to fill in that table? Here is, here, oh, okay. Here's how you do it. First, ignore the denominator, okay? Just consider the numerator. So first you fill the table in with just the numerator, okay? You calculate this value for each table entry, right? Now the bottom, the denominator looks god awful horrible, okay? But actually the bottom is really simple, okay? It's deceptive. It's just an example of the, the mathematical notation making it look worse than it is. Because if you actually fill in each of these entries, so you put in this top thing here, I don't know, I'll call it G. I, don't, I shouldn't use G because I have it for other things. All you do then is go back and renormalize each column to sum the one. So for each column, you sum it up, it won't sum the one. See, it's the numerator that makes this sum the one. So you just can calculate it without the numerator. I'm sorry, it's the denominator that makes the sum the one. You calculate it without the denominator, then you go back, and for each column you sum and renormalize, right? So what's the computational complexity of implementing this entire thing? People know what computational complexity is? So what's the computational complexity? The number of rows here is M, and the, and the number of columns is N. What's the computational complexity of filling this table in? Think about it. So the initial filling in with the numerator takes how much computation? Just m times n, because it's, it's linear in m and n, right? Then what about the renormalization? That requires that you sum each column, right? What's the computational complexity of summing along a column? It's, each one is M for each column, and the number of columns is N. So what's the, to compute all those partial sums, it requires what? It's N times M again, right? And then renormalizing, by, you have to divide each entry by one of these values, right? How much computation is that? It's N times M. So the entire thing is O of, okay, I, I'm not, is that how they do it? O of M times N, oops, N times N. So it's linear in the number of states and then linear in time, okay? Does everybody understand that? Does that make sense? Okay, so it's ugly, but it's simple. Now once you have that, computing the ends, to compute the ends, you just sum the rows. What's the linear, what's the complexity of summing the rows? It's n times n. So that's, this is n times n, right? Is there a way of writing on top of this thing? I don't even know. Okay, I won't worry about it. Let's see, I could get really fancy. This is. This 
this is O of N M, right? This is O of N M, right? Now what about this? That's also O of N M because what you have to do is, well, it's not even that. Um, you teach each one of these. That's just O of um, uh, of M, right? Because you have to do it for each class. Now here, let's see. For each output N, this starts to get a little trickier. What's the complexity here? For each output M, each class, you've got to sum over all time, right? But you have to do that for every class. So, uh, so you take then, so once you have the P's in here, now for each, you, sum, you have to sum over, over uh, time, okay? You take each corresponding, the, t the, sample, the measurement at this time, multiply by its weight, add it to the measurement here, times this weight, and you sum across, right? So you have to do that, and then, yeah, it's the same thing, by the way. It's again, it's N of M. I feel like there's an M squared here somewhere. Uh, hold on. For every... Oh, that happens in a Henry Markle model, right. I'm sorry, what's your question? Are we fixing M for these updates? What's M? M. Uh, I mean, the lowercase M or the uppercase M? The lowercase M. Well, you fix M. And you sum this over n, and then you change m, and you sum it over n again, because this is this is true for all m. So you have to do this. It says for all values of m. Okay, I didn't know for doing the whole thing for one step. So uh, this entire thing is one step in the EM algorithm. We have to do for each m. So you're saying for each. 12.17 is done for all n at once? The way to do it, the, the way to think of it, and I guess I could have written this, but you know, there's always a, a trade-off between clarity and uh, precision. In, in practice, what you would really do if you were writing the code is you'd have, you'd say for for m equals zero to m minus one. This is like old-fashioned coding. You have a loop over m. So for each m, you do this sum over n. That, okay, then, then is the top one supposed to just be n, or is the m? The so, okay, o, m, n refers to the entire step. Each, each iteration of the step is only, is only n, okay? But we have to do it, I'm like, I'm thinking about what it means to do it for each m, right? The entire computation. And then, Follow-up question, then 12.18 be n squared? Because you have to do the sum over nm for each m. For each no, there's no sum over n there. Because you know the n, so you don't have to do any sum. Right. So that's really fast. Okay. Okay, thank you. So the total complexity in the algorithm is y. It's mn complexity. Um, all right, okay? So it, it's reasonably fast. It's linear in, in time and space. In, not time, in time and class, right? 
Okay. Now, uh, okay. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I'm going to end up not having done what I said I would do. But I did want to hit this hard because <laughs> the whole idea is that this is okay. Now, here's some theory stuff. Blah de blah de blah. We'll skip all that. Okay. Let me just touch on this so that you're thinking about it for next time. Okay. Um, Okay, so it's going to turn out that when you do this stuff, it always kind of works out pretty into, okay. So in some sense, this is like a, a much to do about nothing, right? I mean, these are pretty intuitive. It's just like, oh, instead of doing, if you had made hard classifications, you would have just summed over the y's corresponding to each class. And the only thing that would have been different is this n would have been an integer instead of like, you know, a real value. And then you would have made these hard classifications. So this is just a soft classification version of what you would have done intuitively, right? But it required like pages and pages, and we actually dropped a number of the calculations, okay? It took pages and pages of calculation, okay? It took a lot of calculation. And it was a little bit tricky calculations too, I would say, okay? So is there an easier way to do this? Because in the end, what you get is pretty intuitive. It's pretty obvious, right? So there must be a shortcut to get there. Well, there is a shortcut. So in order to understand the shortcut, we have to first introduce a concept called exponential distributions. Um, so a, a, a probability density function is, is exponential if it has uh, the following form. Uh, it, OK, no, that's not true. OK, first, um, t. Okay, T is a sufficient statistic. Okay, let's do this first. T is a sufficient, T, a sufficient statistic. Okay, a statistic is any function of the data, if you recall. And a sufficient statistic is a statistic uh, which has the following property. A sufficient statistic has to be defined in the context of some parameter, okay? So in other words, something isn't a sufficient statistic for everything. It has to be a, you have to say, well, this is my prob probability, family of probability densities, parameterized by the following parameter. And if I can write the probability density in this following form, then T is a sufficient statistic for theta, okay? And the intuition here is that what it says is that if you know t, you have everything you need to know in order to estimate theta. That keeping the additional information, usually what ends up happening is t is a lower dimensional version of y. Somehow it's, it's encoded the information into a more compact form. It, normally the mapping from y to t is not one to one, right? In other words, normally you get like it's many to one. So you can't reverse it, okay? You've thrown away information. But the information you've thrown away is not useful for estimating theta. So it's, you've, you've, consul you've con consolidated the information. The classical example is that if you're trying to estimate the mean and variance of a large set of data, you don't need the whole, you need the whole set of data, but you can consolidate data down to taking the sum of the samples and the sum of the square. If you know the sum and the sum of the square, from that you can calculate uh, the, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate or any estimate, any useful estimate for the mean and the variance, okay? Okay, so that's a, that's a sufficient statistic. And then, um, so, and this just shows, okay, examples of sufficient statistics for the exponential fam. Okay, now the, the, here's a big idea. So you're going to read this, right? I'm going to go over here and then you're going to read it because it's a little bit subtle. There's a concept of an exponential family. Basically, every distribution you use, with the exception of the Cauchy distribution, because the Cauchy distribution is mostly its main value or its main purpose uh, in what we do is like as a counterexample, okay? Because and the reason it's a good counterexample is because it's not exponential, okay? So I mean, excuse me. Once in a while, people use Cauchy distributions for at real application spaces, like in financial markets. They'll use it to market, model the the tail distribution on like financial events because every once in a while, the entire financial system kind of goes kablooey, okay? As you may have observed. Okay, so. But mostly, okay, but most distributions like Gaussian, exponential, Poisson, 
uh, gamma chi squared uh, multi, uh, um, multinomial binomial basically any distribution you can think of for the most part is is exponential and it means it can be written in the following form where there's some function of y and okay it's a sufficient statistic and it's a sufficient statistic because it's going to turn out from this you can show that it, ha it meets the constraints of this, this definition of a sufficient statistic and a to here is some function of the parameter it can be a nonlinear these can both be nonlinear functions this is an inner product which is, means it's linear in both things okay and then these are just this is some function of theta and some function of y if you can write it like that it's an exponential distribution and by the way this is why if you know at the beginning of class I think I got some people who would ask they say why do we always take the log as the first step okay this is why because if you have an exponential distribution when you take the log it makes it simpler it makes puts it in this form in which things are basically linear uh, or can be made linear okay so if you have an exponent here's the beautiful thing it's like so simple it's hard to explain if you have an exponential distribution then there's some function you maximize this for whatever it is that eta and, and t and d are it doesn't matter there's something okay and you maximize it and when you do the maximization that's going to be some function of t right so that's the maximum likelihood estimator and here's the thing that's kind of cool when you do the when you derive the q function it's almost so easy that it's hard to explain hold on okay when you do the oh okay we're out of time when you do the q function what ends up happening is because of this linear structure the expectation comes into the t okay and it's going to ever have a sort of simple answer okay we got to go now but i'll finish this up next time and then we'll go on to the next topic okay i'll see you on wednesday thanks bye